Oh, either. I guess it's not fair to have my personal prayer meeting at your expense. And if I don't quit now, I may not come back for a while. I would like to just develop that for another hour or two, but... Hallelujah. I long for the day, you know, I have to recognize you need of edification, but I look for the day when nobody's going to need edification from the pulpit, but everyone can move right in and be edified so that no matter what we do, we don't have to worry and wait about how many are waiting to be edified, but they can move into whatever is being done and be edified at the same time. And then, you know, you can sing for an hour, you can just praise the Lord. I mean, the Lord can, you know, and, and different ones at different times can intersperse different things. And nobody has to worry about anybody in the congregation because everyone knows how to flow into it and be edified. I'm waiting for that day. And then the services will be fully and truly led by the Holy Spirit. A man is so oriented that if he doesn't get, you know, the same thing he had the last four meals, the last 200 meals, he wonders, where's the dinner, you know? Where's the salad first, and then you have this, and then you have that. But um, the Lord is a Lord of variety. I feel good in my soul. One thing, probably the greatest thing that has happened to me in the last few months, and it's hard really to say this with conviction because several things have happened that are all stand up there and tiptoe and vibe with one another is just that real knowledge inside that God's running the show and he's going to do what he wants. And people may clamor and slack against the devil, my rage and holler and hoot and holler and, uh, and growl, but it's all going to get done God's way. And that God's going to get his people there whether they think he can or not. God's going to bring the rain whether the people think he can or not. God's going to loose people's strings of the tongue so that the dumb can sing and those that cannot speak can speak in a mighty, eloquent anointing. God's going to take care of his own. He'll give the strength so that the weak can say, I am strong. And uh, come oppositions, come devil, come whatever, God knows how to turn things all around so it's all to his good pleasure and advantage. And he knows how to use things to humble us, to cause us to come together, to cause us to get rid of our problems, to see our problems, to trust completely on him, to go to prayer, to seek him. And then he turns it around all to his glory. And he could have done that in the first place, but he's building children, building saints. He could have done it the easy way, but that doesn't build saints. And so, I just appreciate the Lord so much, knowing that everything's in his hands. Praise the Lord. This is, I believe, part four in the series on the Feast of Tabernacles, and the, the last of the messages. Get over to where I left off. In the book of Deuteronomy, please, if you turn there, chapter 16. At least when we have finished these series, you'll have a knowledge of these feasts that perhaps you didn't have before. Got a wish to travel, even though I tried to quit last week. Deuteronomy 16, 13. Thou shalt observe the Feast of Tabernacles. Seven days, that's that perfected number. After that thou hast gathered in thy corn and thy wine. Now, he means the corn of wheat, and he means, as it's called in the scripture, uh, one place, and he means the, um, uh, not immediately after, because the wine comes sometime after the corn of wheat. But after you have gathered in your harvest, your corn, your Pentecost, and your wine, which comes later, right after the time of the, of the vintage comes the harvest festival of tabernacles with, the, with other fruits. And he says, Thou shalt observe the feast of tabernacles 
after you've gathered in your corn and after you've gathered in your wine, it comes right after that, after these other things have been gathered in. And thou shalt rejoice in thy feast. This is to be a feast of rejoicing, of gladness. The harvest is in. You, with souls have been won. The gospel has gone out to the ends of the earth and drawn in all who will come. And all oh, there are so many that have come. And it comes to the unity of the faith. Thou and thy sons and thy daughter and thy manservant and thy maidservant and the Levite and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow and those that are within thy gates. All of these shall, those that are widows, those that are fatherless, orphans, all those within the gates, everyone who remains within the gates shall observe the feast of tabernacles. I've encouraged the people to stay in the boat. I could say stay in the walls and the gates. Stay inside the city of God. Even the stranger that has come in within thy gate. He's been a stranger to the commonwealth of Israel, to the knowledge of God. But he's now he is numbered among us. He, he shall also. All those that come in, for whomsoever will, to the Lord may come. Whatever stranger to come to the city of God may come. I want to read you Matthew twenty four fourteen in just for just a moment. I have it right here. And the, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And the tabernacle, feast of tabernacles, is at the end. It's the end of the harvest, and then the feast of tabernacles shall come. He could say. It's the ingathering feast. And of course, it's part of the ingathering. It's the last of the ingathering, but there's been a lot of ingathering before that. Verse 15 Seven days shalt thou keep a solemn feast unto the Lord thy God in the place which the Lord shall choose. God shall choose the place. It shall not be upon whomsoever, you know, though I have seen churches, and there are a lot of them, they will not accept revival unless it comes through them. If there's a revival in the land and it's coming to somebody else, they won't bother to even go look at it. Can't be right unless it comes through them. That was one of the problems that the Sadducees and the Pharisees had. The Messiah did not come down in a chariot of fire, as the tradition said he would, and join them. Surely he would join them, be their king, pat the Pharisees in the back and say, well done. And then blast the Omaha res Jew or the non-religious Jew. But he didn't come that way and it stumbled them. A lot of people have fixed ideas how God's going to do things. If it doesn't come in a fixed way, it stumbles them and they cannot be a part of it. Because the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thine increase. We shall increase. Healthy sheep bear lambs. A wheat of, put into the soil dies and becomes a crop of 30 grains of wheat, or 60-fold, or 100-fold. And in the works of thy hands, the works are put into our hands. We have a ministry to do. Therefore thou shalt surely rejoice. Rejoicing over what's been accomplished by the work that's been put into our hands, so there shall be increase. And God shall choose the place. And I may also add, he chooses the time. He set the time of the tabernacle. And it shall come, and shall not tarry. Now, the booths that they build remind them that they are pilgrims, strangers here. They are on a pilgrimage. We are passing through this land on a pilgrimage. And therefore, we don't stop and dig down deep and build deep foundations Join all the Rotary Clubs of America and all the rest and become a part and parcel of the 
land in which we are strangers, but yearning through. You see, when you are from a certain land, yearning as a pilgrim, on a pilgrimage, and a stranger to another land, the people, the customs, are strange to you. Therefore, you do not feel a part of them. And therefore, you don't join them. Because they are strange to you. They are not your type, your class. It isn't your thing. So you pass just through them, you keep aloof from them and go on. Jesus said, you're in the world, but not of the world. Therefore, the world does hate you. Those about you can't join you and you can't join them. If you live for Jesus on the job, they don't invite you to their parties. And if you get invited to the parties, you better look at your testimony on the job. It reminds us, it reminded them, the, the booze, that they came out of Egypt. They came out of the wilderness. They wandered in the wilderness, but God's leading and protection was with them even in the wilderness. We thank the Lord for that. But there's a promised land beyond the wilderness where you can plant the seed for yourself and have it grow up. You can plant Christ and have it grow up. There's a time in your Christian life you're not planting Christ. You're only receiving manna falling out of heaven, and all you have to do is pick it up. You're spoon-fed. But there comes a time when you can plant it and watch it grow and develop. Become fathers with the Lord. Not just babes, or even young men, but fathers. You know, the first stage, you know, you're just a baby, you just want to be fed. The second stage, you're young men, you want to go out and defeat the devil. The third stage, you want to take care of the people. You want to be a father and, and take care of God's heritage. Multiply the Father's heart on the earth. Let's look at the book of Nehemiah for a moment, chapter 8. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Nehemiah 8, page 497 in your Thompson Chain Bibles, which you all have. I encourage you to get this King James Bible because it's the best one and for studying purposes. And once you have it, I encourage you to listen to our two-hour self-learned tape, which takes you, without wasting any time, step by step, through all the helps in a way that will teach you things that you didn't know you could be taught, even after you looked through it yourself. Nehemiah 8.14, And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month. Now, interesting here, that after the children of Israel had been in bondage for 70 years in Babylonia, and they've now come back to Jerusalem, and they look in the law, they are surprised to learn what the Word of God says. You know, there's a lot of Christians that are surprised to learn what the Word of God says. People call up and say, well... Do you find in the Bible any place that you have a right to put anybody out of a church? I never heard of such a thing. I don't know anybody put anybody out of churches. They're flabbergasted at the concept. Well, you get a number of scriptures. Say, well, I think it would be maybe more proper to say, well, do you find precedence in the scriptures to allow these things to go on and not put people out? How do you, can you condone such a thing? But you see, people don't know so little about the Bibles. They are so amazed to find in the Bibles things that say, Thou shalt not do what they're doing all the time. And things saying, Thou shalt do what they don't do. They are amazed to find that they in the Bible disagree from time to time as things are brought up. They don't know the word. And so here also, they found out in, by reading the law, Hey, we're supposed to be dwelling in booze. They had lost it from the church. The truth had been lost. Oh, there are so many truths lost from the church. Even today, I could rattle off to you a list of Catholic, Catholic uh, uh, doctrines that are still being kept by Protestant churches. Ones that came out of the Dark Ages, invented by councils of men that had nothing to do with the Bible whatsoever. And many of them not only anti-scriptural, I mean not only... Um, 
so much uh, extra scriptural, outside of scriptural, but also anti scriptural. But they found this out and that they should publish and proclaim in the, all those cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth into the mount and fetch olive branches and pine branches and myrtle branches and palm branches and branches of thick trees to make booze as it is written. So the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booze, every one upon the roof of his house and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the streets of the water gate and in the street of the gate of Ephraim and all the congregation of them that will come again out of the captivity made booze and sat under the booze for since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until that day had not the children of Israel done so. And there was very great gladness. A couple of interesting things here. One is, and they did this as it is written, not as they were accustomed to do. They could have said, well, I never heard of such a feast. It's not our tradition, historical tradition to do such a thing. Well, we don't do that. But they found what was written, and they decided to change the beliefs and doctrines and ideas and practices to what was written. And we have got to continually change to what is written, not defend against, accuse, and penknife out what is written. That is not agree. Whenever we say, I don't think that's right, and somebody shows you the scripture, you should say, pardon me, Lord, I didn't know I was ignorant. Now I believe also with thee. That's what we must do. Because we've got a, we've got a lot to learn, and we must continually learn. And if you already know everything, you've got nothing else to learn. Now, the second thing that's interesting here is that it, when they came over to Canaan's land, all the time of Joshua... They kept the feast. But after the days of Joshua, they quit keeping it. They also quit keeping the Passover. They also quit keeping the sabbatical year. Uh, they also quit keeping the feast of Pentecost. They quit, they, the feast just fell out. They no longer were remembering. Why? Because they had fallen into sin. Because they weren't caring that much anymore that they came out of Egypt. They were already back in Egypt. They were, there wasn't a rejoicing anymore in the church. There wasn't the same faith and hope. When the church doesn't live for God, it doesn't have the hope. When you're in the world, you don't have the same faith and hope and vision. Neither do you have the same care for knowing the scriptures. There are churches throughout America in which the people never read the Bibles. The Bible is something you, you log weddings, deaths, and births in and keep the baby's hair in. And if you ever want to borrow the Bible to read something to them when you're witnessing, you have to blow the dust off the cover first. It hasn't been used for a long, long time. Sometimes you have to go and find it in a cabinet someplace. You have to look two or three places to find out where it is. You know they're not Bible mouths. You know they're not much in the Word of God. God's people need to know His Word. Otherwise, you and God cannot agree, and you don't know what God is like. Every male must keep the feast. Now, here's two interesting things. The law said, every male must keep the feast if not legally precluded. There were some instances in which they were not allowed to keep the feast. If they had not brought themselves to a certain position, if they were not in a certain state, they couldn't keep the feast. So with us, everyone within the gate, everyone within the churches of Jesus Christ that remain and don't backslide and stay within the gate, shall keep the feast. The Lord will get those, no matter if you're discouraged, down, new, or whatever. If you stay in the city of God, you will, unless you fall into one of these categories in which you are legally disallowed to keep the feast. And there you have to stand and watch others keep it and cannot keep it yourself. And there were some of those in Israel that could not keep the feast. And uh, we don't want anyone here to be one of those, do we? Secondly, if you were able-bodied. There were people that were not able-bodied. 
There were people that were um, physically uh, diseased and inca 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 incapacitated and were not capable of keeping that typological feast. Now, that does not mean in any wise that today, if you're crippled, that you cannot keep the feast. But it was typologi typ uh, typological of something, and it does mean that if you, if you the anti-type of that spiritually, that is, if you're spiritually crippled and spiritually diseased, you cannot keep that feast. We've got to be spiritually whole, or else we can't keep the feast. We're not required to keep it, neither can we keep it in some cases. Now, every day for the seven-day feast, they offered sacrifices. <clears throat> they offered a goat sin offering. <clears throat> a goat represents that which, you know, uh, which uh, takes the sins. See, uh, uh, a lamb represents that which is... Um, the, sh the shepherd has the lambs. Uh, or they represent the saints, the part of the sheep. I mean, part of the sheepfold. But in the last day, you remember, the scripture says he divides the sheep from the goats. And the goats go into judgment. Well, Christ became the goat, as you remember, on the Day of Atonement, in the, feast of, in the larger Feast of Tabernacles. And one goat had to be slain, and the other goat had to have the sins of the people imputed to it and be taken out to take the sins away. One was his crucifixion, and one represented taking the, the sins away. He became the goat. He became the judgment. Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree, the scripture says. But he hung there not for his sins, but for ours. And uh, he who knew no sin became sin, the scripture says, legally. And therefore, we got goat. That's why we have a goat sacrifice. It's the sin sacrifice. And um, so, uh, a goat was offered every day. That makes seven uh, goats. One for every day. You know, every day of the feast, though Christ, be, Christ was efficacious as that sin offering and fulfilled the full number of seven. And then on the eighth day, that day of new beginnings, a special Sabbath feast which followed the seventh day Sabbath, the next one after the Feast of Tabernacles, which was not properly a part of the Feast of Tabernacles, the eighth day, there was also a goat offered. Which means it was a day of new beginning, which means that even your new beginning in Christ is predicated on the fact that he became the goat. Then there was 14 lambs offered every day. Now, you would think that seven lambs being a perfect number would be the right number. But here was not only enough, but more than enough. It was twice the number. Two is used many times in scriptures as as more than enough, uh, the extra sufficiency. Two times the number, uh, seven, times seven days is 98 goats. And then one on the day, on the eighth day, makes 99 goats. But the number 99 is significant only in that it falls one short of that perfect number 100 that he uses. And so there's one left, less uh, sh lambs than 100. Jesus left the 99 to search for the one to fulfill the hundred. See, he used the hundred as a number in the sheepfold. Interesting enough that he left 99 to get to hunt for the one. See, there's going to be a great ingathering. He's not going to leave the one to hunt for the 99. Praise the Lord that in the last ingathering, they're going to come in, brother. I mean, it is encouraging to know that he's going to leave 99 to get one rather than leave one to get 99. And then they also, every day, offered two rams. Now, a ram was a, a, a major sacrifice for those that could afford it. They were in that position. And uh, one ram a day should have been sufficient, but two is more than enough. You know, the scripture says, where well, grace abound, well, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And that Greek word means it's a hooper over uh, poizo, is what it is, something like this. I can't remember exactly now, but it, it means, uh, I remember reading a number of years ago in Kenneth Wiest, he says what it really means is it's, an, it's overthrowing, or it's overthrowing, it's more than enough and then some more pile on top of that. 
It's if well, grace abounded to the full, I mean sin to the full. That's what that word abound means. Grace to the full, brought to the I mean sin brought to the full. Grace was heaped way over and more piled on top of that. More than enough. There's more than enough grace in Jesus Christ. It isn't barely enough. Can you love me enough? Is, is there any for me? More than enough. Two rams a day. And then the bullocks, the priests, they were the most expensive, and the priests offered the bullocks, the greatest in offering. And there was 13 on the first day, and they offered one less every day. And there was 13, and there was 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, and then seven. And it stopped at that perfect number seven. There was a diminishing need. The more they offered sacrifice, the less they needed to keep offering that sacrifice. Because God was doing that work. There was less and less sins uh, to be uh, atoned for. And when you count all these bullocks up, the number is 70. Now, the number 70 in Scripture is interesting in a few places. One is where God uh, caused Moses to uh, appoint 70 elders. 70 in the eldership. And these are the sin offerings for those in the priesthood. Next, Christ appointed 70 disciples. Before they really had an apostolic ministry, 70 disciples to go out and to multiply him. Even as Moses had 70 elders to multiply him. Moses being a type of Christ too. We also find in the book of Daniel that there were 70 weeks of years until the covenant of the Messiah would be confirmed. Seventy weeks of years. And so there would be bullocks necessary and for those seventy weeks of years until that time was confirmed. And at the end of that time, then uh, we find out the covenant is there already, no longer needs confirming, but is being practiced in the presence of God. In the book of Deuteronomy, in uh, uh, chapter 16 and verse 14 again, again, there was just one more point, uh, and that it is, he tells us in that feast to rejoice. For all are to rejoice before the Lord. And he points out the different classes of people that are there. Uh, he says, and thou shalt take... Oh, Leviticus, just a moment. Deuteronomy 16:14. And thou shalt rejoice in the, in the feast, thou and thy son and thy daughter and thy manservant and thy maidservant and the Levite and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow that are within thy gates. All rejoice in the Lord. What do we have him? When the, with the, what do we have here with all these different people all rejoicing in the Lord on the same feast concerning the same thing they're of one mind, they're of one judgment, they're coming to a unity in God, there's a fellowship among them, whether they be this or this or this, whether they be babes or whether they be fathers, no matter what they be, there's a, speaks of the universal church of Christ in which all in it shall rejoice together and come with the same mind and rejoice together in Jesus Christ. Now, in summary, I want to say that we see here the at one moment, on the Day of Atonement, we see that what, what does this all mean now, spiritually ahead of us? There's going to be a unity. The unity of the faith that God has promised. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and to a perfect man. The harvest will, become, will be in. The work will be over. Fruits will come into the church. All the various fruits of the Spirit shall be in operation and shall be to the full. And all the saints and all the many splendid uh, attributes and graces and gifts that God has given will be brought in. The wine will be brought in on the leaves. The rejoicing that comes from the vintage of the grapes, which represent the saints, uh, they, when pressed out and God, they were settled, you know, not become too settled, but settled a little bit and poured, 
from vessel to vessel at the right time off of the dregs all mellowed and the result of those saints picked from the vine as God puts them from container to container in the right way and amount and timing means that the wine of rejoicing there is in a perfect condition. It's perfect for him. This is what he wants. Also, we see a rejoicing. We see a uni unity in the universal body of Christ. We see that we dwell in these tents, these tabernacles, these booths, these temporary dwelling places, these houses of clay, that the Hebrews call the receptacle and the Greeks call schema, or tents, or temporary dwelling places, until we get to heaven. We see there's a rest. It is the Sabbath. We cease from our own labors, and we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. That's going to happen. It won't be the striving to live for Christ. It'll be the yielding to live for Christ. And then we'll find that what is ahead is the climax of all the feasts of the whole year. That'll be the climax of everything that's happened from Calvary, Pentecost, and finally to the end. And we'll find, as the scripture says, many places we shall have the blessing of God. Uh, a side connection in the Song of Solomon, if you, everybody would turn there, please. I want to bring you a picture of the bride in a certain connection at that time. Now, this is right after Proverbs and Ecclesi uh, Psalms and, and Ecclesiastes, and Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and right before Isaiah. In the Song of Solomon, and we want to turn to chapter 7. We get most of the people who have been to Bible college a great deal, know the scriptures quickly, but we have new ones in from time to time. Help you be able to find the places quickly. Psalm seven one. I mean Song of Solomon seven one, the Song of Songs. First Solomon saying to Abishag the Shulamite, the spouse to be his wife, which represents Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God, the King of Salem, the King of Peace, the King of Israel. In relation to the most beautiful of all the damsels in the land in Israel, it was his, his bride, over and above the concubines and the queens that have been inherited from David of old and the virgins who are too young to be uh, wives and have not been selected, uh, is this Shulamite, this choice one of a mother of the church. And so he is saying to her, as she has progressed from the early stages, for she, well, she was afraid to have him look upon her, for she was black outwardly, and she'd been working in the vineyards of another church being forced, and, and she uh, wanted his kisses, but, uh, and she fell asleep uh, under the, under when, he, when, he, when he loved her, and, and she wasn't willing to pay a price to get to the door to have him, and, and although she wanted him, and she sought him, but she sought him while she was half asleep on her bed, and uh, all of these, she's come to a place where she is now mature, beautiful, and ready for him. And she comes to that place at the Feast of Tabernacles in chronological time, prophetic time. And so he says to her, How beautiful are thy feet with shoes, O princess daughter! The joints of thy thighs are like jewels. The work of the hands of a cunning workman. I won't go into a lot of detail here, other than to say... He's talking about her walk. And he's saying that her feet are beautiful. And her feet are in sandals, in shoes crafted and made of God. She doesn't have to walk in the dirt of this world, but she places her feet in that which was made by the King of Kings. That is beautiful. And her feet are demure. Uh, that is, I mean, they are graceful. And she walks demurely. She... She's not clumsily, her body is not discoordinated. She's not clumsily clopping along. Her body, she is the most gorgeous girl and a perfect, and so, and her love and her heart causes her feet to run to him with joy. And her walk is, she, her feet are clean, they're not bruised with rocks, 
not scratched with thorns. She hasn't been out hobnobbing in the bushes, not in the dirt. She's been in the palace. She's been in his presence, so clean and white. And he says that these are the work of a cunning workman. The scripture says in Ephesians that the church, that we are the results of his workmanship. It's not her own ability. She didn't say, well, I've been practicing my athletics and ballet, and I've been working on me, and I had another, uh, some surgeons, and I had some plastic surgeons, and I've been developing myself, and it wasn't that. The spiritual is, this is the work of a cunning craftsman. Somebody else has been working on this and bringing it to this place. God has been, is working on his church. He is bringing it. We are not self-made men. He's bringing us to the place that he wants us to be. Now, in verses 1 to 9, he uh, speaks of, of her and all of her beauty. And uh, if you take the Song of Solomon, this fall for me, uh, you'll get the details of that. But right now, he goes on to tell how beautiful she is in all of her parts, every area of her ministry. Everything he sees in her is beauty. Now, that's going to be wonderful when the church comes to a place. When that happens. Now, this is tied in with the time element of the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's why I'm bringing it to you. And that's the time the bride hath made herself ready, as the scripture says. And she's without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And then, uh, down in, in verse ten, uh, 10, uh, she says, she speaks, and she says, I am my beloved's. And his desire is toward me. Now, she's thrilled. That is, a, she, she is, of course, saying, I, I'm my beloved. I mean, you know Solomon? Anybody ever heard of him, the king of all Israel? She's talking today to Solomon. You know the king who stands head and shoulders above everybody else that's handsome? It's according to the scriptures. Head and shoulders above everybody else. Handsome, the wisest man on earth. The richest man on earth. And I'm his. <laughs> and, I'll tell you something else. His desires toward me. This is where all of his affection desires are. Uh, he loves his kingdom. He loves uh, those in his palace. And all those that have, that have been uh, joined to him. And those he inherited. But his desires toward me. Here's the desire is. Although he loves everybody. Come down to that bride. That finished bride. That's where his desire is. And then she says, and, well, and, and of course, see, her desires, his desires toward her for a purpose, for a reason, too. She says, he desires for me because I'm, I'm submissive to him. A man loves a wife who is submissive to him. Uh, I love him with all my heart. That makes him love her. I have one heart with him. I don't have some other deal. I do my thing and he does his. I have one heart with him. What his desire is is mine. That makes him love her. I offer myself for his pleasure. I'm not just trying to see how much I can get out of him. I want him to be happy with me. That makes him love her. This is what we must do. Not only in the natural marriages, but more so even in the spiritual. Now, verse 11. She says to him, Come, my beloved, let us go forth into the field. Let us lodge in the villages. Throughout the Song of Solomon, you see, he calls her his love. She calls him his beloved. Normally, he would say, come, let's do this. But she is eager. And this is showing her eagerness, for she is saying to him, come. We, we tell Jesus things. We say, Lord, I want you to just bless me. Lord, I want you to... In fact, she even starts off saying, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. I want to be kissed, she says. I want his love. She's showing something. You know, a man doesn't want a woman to do everything in lovemaking. But he wants her to show some interest. He doesn't want her just to be there, just passive. He wants her to show some initiative excitement in him. We need to say, Lord, I love you, not just, well, I love you too, Lord. It's not always a response. But sometimes uh, initiation of love. She says, Come, my beloved, 
Let us go forth into the field. Now, the field here speaks of a place alone. She's not speaking, let's go down and, um, and see how the harvest is getting along because the grain has been harvested long before this time. She's not saying, let's go work in the field because she is not a laborer in the field. She's a lover, not a laborer. She's, a, she's, a, she's a, the bride. She doesn't have to labor out in that field. <clears throat> now, in this analogy, now, Jesus doesn't need prompting, but sometimes he stays until he's asked. Like the, when he came to the house of Peter uh, by the Sea of Galilee, the scripture says, as they begin to turn into Peter's house, Jesus made as though he would go further. And they constrained him. And so he came into the house. Rather than just to assume and presume upon them and presume upon their food and their time, he, w he just went as though he, would, he knew he was going to stay there. But he was going to go on unless they asked him. And only when they constrained him, they had to ask him two or three times, then he turned in. And then the Lord knows your telephone number and your house number are true. But you've got to constrain him a little bit. He'll go on if you don't care enough to invite him, and he won't impose himself upon you. Now, the field speaks of being alone with him uh, to communicate love. When I was courting my wife, uh, we sometimes had trouble. She lived out on the farm. And as I would come down the road to meet her, getting off the bus, her younger brother and sister would race down the road to grab me by the arms and legs and so forth. And she waited there in the back, down there in the front yard of the house, waiting for me while they came bouncing along on my arms. And we got there. And um, after dinner or whatnot, we would go, want to go take a walk out in the meadow and, and uh, lie under a tree and lay down, I mean, sit down under a tree and talk and visit, be alone. It was always difficult because those two wanted, didn't know why they couldn't tag along. They wanted to come also. And uh, my wife had a terrible time getting rid of them. <laughs> but uh, uh, the shoemate wants to be alone in the field at they get out away from the hustle and the bustle of the people, the homes where people are. In Genesis twenty four sixty three, we read that Isaac went out into, to meditate in the field. He went out to be alone, to meditate, to think, to talk to God. In First Samuel twenty eleven, we read Jonathan said to David, "Come, let us go into the field." And you see the context. He wanted to walk and talk with him alone, to communicate with him some secret things of what had happened. Let him know for his own protection. What that was happening. He wanted to go out into the field. She wanted to go in the field to be, be alone with him, to communicate with him. This didn't mean a plowed field, but out into the field of whatever, grains or grasses or whatever. So the Shulamite is not a worker, but a lover. Now, she says, concerning going to the field, also, let us lodge in the villages. Now, she wanted to go into the field to be alone with him, but she wanted to go into the villages to fellowship with others. There was also a time to not be alone, get into the village where people are, fellowship with the rest of the churches there. Let us get up early to, to the vineyards and see if the vine flourish. She wanted to also go down to the vineyard and check the vines. The vineyards in the scriptures speak of the church and the saints that come from the church. We all... See, uh, he, uh, Christ is the vine and we are the branches and we bear forth fruit. And she wants to go down and check the fruits that are coming from the vines and check the vines, see how we're doing. Now, she's not worried about the main stem, Christ. He's that's all right. She, she wants to know what, what's happening in the offshoots. What's happening with us? What kind of fruit we're bearing? Um, and then she says, and whether... The tender grape appeal. Now, the tender grape is the new convert. A little tender new grape. Let's see if we're getting, we're getting new converts on the vine. Because they will grow up to be big grapes one day, be nice and sweet. And the pomegranate's bud. Now she's talking about other fruits that come right after the vintage. See where they've come forth. And though I will give thee my loves. Now, not love, but loves. Loves. Uh, uh, differs from love in that love speaks of a, a, a general uh, feeling and heart expression, but loves are individual 
uh, lovings, individual specific uh, things. I will give you my loves. Just looking to see if I've missed any point here. We also see in verse 12, she says, let us get up early to go to the vineyards. Now, earliness shows an eagerness to get down there. If you want to get up early to go down, you're eager. She becomes the bride of Christ is concerned about the, the vineyard. She wants to get up early to go down and check it. Not wait until the very end to see how it's doing, but she wants to check it early, be sure it's all right. And that's what God has put upon the hearts of his bride to kill about the vineyard. Now we read in verse 13, the mandrakes give a good smell. Now mandrakes were a small yellow fruit with white green blossoms. And they resembled rhubarb with an aromatic plum-sized fruit. And they call them love apples. They were regarded, you remember, by Rachel as a uh, stimulus for fertility. And they thought that, just like a lot of people today and in the last 20 years thought, you know, fish is a brain food and, and uh, blackstrap molasses and yogurt, you know, that'll make you healthier than Samson. And, you know, people have all kinds of fat ideas from time to time about different foods, what they'll do for you, you know. And uh, they had that idea. It was common among them. And so it was used uh, 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 probably uh, in connection with that which was in fertility because it was commonly thought of in that day. And you see that in Genesis 30, verse 14. They give a good smell. You know what that means? The time at his hand for the harvest. When they're smelling, they give a good smell. You know they're right. And uh, it's time for the harvest. That means the union. That means the wheat can be gathered with the he who wants the wheat. That means the love is going to be shown between the bride and and the groom. She says, the mandates give a smell and are at our gates. Our gates means that it's close at hand. And all manner of pleasant fruits, new and old, which I have laid up for thee, O my beloved. Now, new and old means those that have been gathered earlier, that have been dried, and those that are new and fresh. And they've all been saved up for Solomon. So, she says, I have laid up for thee. See, she had a responsibility given to her as the bride to bring forth fruit to Christ. She was a spouse to him. And once you're a spouse, you're called the bride. We, are called, we call ourselves the bride, even though the wedding hasn't taken place yet. And that's the way it was with them. Now, the fruit of her ministry is now for his enjoyment. I have laid it up for thee, not I have laid it up for me. We are not to minister to lay up fruit for us, but to lay up fruit for him. Of course, when he brings us in, then all he has is ours also, and we become joint heirs with Jesus Christ the righteous. And so the converts and the saints are now in his hands. She gives all the fruits to him. As long as she has the responsibility of the vineyard, she has responsibility of the fruit, whether to pluck that one off, because it's rotten now, and throw it away from the vine. Even if Paul said, I would, that they that trouble you be cut off. And so he cuts off this one and, and takes care of it and watches out for the fox that would, foxes that damage the vine and take care of it and prune it back and all that. But once she comes at this point of time, at the Feast of Tabernacles, at the time of the food harvest, once this is over, the time of the ingathering, she turns and gives the whole thing back over to him. And now all the saints are in his hands. Do what he wants. Now, I just have a couple of minutes. Chapter 8, verse 1. All that thou wert as my brother that suck the breast of my mother. When I should find thee without, I would kiss thee. Yea, I would not be despised. Now, what she means by that rather ambiguous uh, statement to Westerners is this. It was not considered decent in that country to kiss people um, in public unless they were your own family, your brother, your that is, your actually blood brother or blood sister, mother or father. So she is there with Solomon and she's in love with him. And mad, passionately in love with him. And she says to him now, because she's in public, she says, oh, I wish you were my brother right now. <laughs> so I could kiss you. The brother sucked the breast of my mother. It was my actual brother. Not my brother in the Lord, but my actual brother. Uh... 
Because when I should find you without, as soon as I get you away from the kitchen and hill, I would kiss you. <laughs> that I should not be despised. Right now, if I do, I'm going to be despised. I, I, I can't be quite that forward. But, oh, I'm holding myself back. Uh, in other words, I want to love you so much, and I've got to hold myself back because of the services, because still people there would judge me if I would show this intimate love to you. They would despise me for showing that love to you. I have to hold myself back because of all the strangers and all the others about who might not consider it decent if I would just haul off and just love you. And that, that happens. But all the time that we can be with him in secret and we can love him. And then she says, I would lead thee and bring thee into my mother's house. Uh-oh. Whenever a girl starts bringing a young man into a mother's house, you know, there's a union that's going to take place. There's a marriage that's going to happen there. Who would instruct me? The church, my mother, would instruct me. I need instruction. She would tell me now. And I would cause thee to drink of the spiced wine of the juice of the pomegranate. And on she goes on. And she's now fantasizing about this, anticipating, I should say, about this marriage. She's going to have this life with him forever. The Bible talks about those He's coming for those who are looking and waiting for his coming. Not those who don't care when he comes, not a bit interested. We read in verse 9, well, verse 8, she says, We have a little sister. Now, she, she mentions the problem she's got. After verse 7, she tells about her love is so strong that, all, uh, that nothing can ever stop that fire, water, you mention it, you name it. And then in verse 8, she says, new paragraph, We have a little sister, and she has no breasts. What should we do for a sister in the day when she should be spoken for? I have a little sister, and she's immature. Now, she should, she should be old enough, you know, when, um, when somebody comes by and says, I want to take the next damsel down in your family. You always have to take the oldest first. The father wasn't about to give a younger one up and keep the older one. Uh, you have to get the older one if you're going to work the way down. And uh, now he said, we have a younger sister. What's going to happen when the day comes, when the bridegroom comes for her, and says, all right, I want her. And then he says, oh, this one's too immature. She's not developed. She can't take care of, of the infants, of converts. She doesn't know how to teach them. She can't milk them out with the sincere milk of the word. She, she's not fully developed. She's not rounded and beautiful. She's too, she's too young. She's immature. She hasn't developed. And then she says, if she be a wall, we will build upon her a palace of silver. If she be a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. Now, that's an awful ambiguous sentence, too. But what it means is, if she is a wall, what does a wall do? A wall keeps out. It guards. It protects. If she be a wall, and those who would try to come in to seduce her, to get her, if she, she resists all the love of the world, and all those who would come in, would keep herself for the love of her soul, for her bridegroom is coming, if she be a wall, and she keeps herself pure in this respect, then we'll build on the wall a palace of silver, and she'll become something. But if she become a door, which is left in, and come right on in, she opens herself up to those who would seduce her into false doctrine or any other way or the things of the world, then we'll enclose her with boards. We'll, we'll, we'll build a wall about her and close her so that she will not be a door. We'll protect her. We're going to make her so she's not opened up to the world. See, the young, older sister is taking care of the younger one. That's what he's given the bride to do, is take care of the new, young one. Sometimes the doors and they should be walls. And then she says of herself, I am a wall. She says, hey, I won't, I won't have any drugs. I won't have any gurus. I won't have any other loves. I won't have any other false doctrine. I won't have any traditions of men. Nothing's going to come in and seduce me away. No demon, no lust of the flesh, no world, no offers of big money. Nothing. I am a wall. And my breast like towers. I am fully developed. I am developed to the full and of a full position. I've come to the completion of a t and that which he is pleased with me to be, that he loves me and I'm beautiful. And then was I in his eyes as one found favor. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Haman and he let out the vineyard into keepers. Every one for fruit thereof, for the fruit thereof was to bring a thousand pieces of silver. In other words, Solomon has these great vineyards and so he lets out this vineyard to this one, to this pastor, 
and this vineyard to this pastor, and this vineyard to this pastor. And so we have all these different individual vineyards, but all together they make one, all the vineyards of Solomon. And for doing that, they, for the fruit that they get from that in the natural, they must pay a thousand pieces of silver to Solomon. They are indebted to him. He is the one who gave this to them. And they are, are in debt to him. They owe him something. Then she says, my vineyard, he gave her vineyard too. The bride has a vineyard. My vineyard, which is mine, is before me. In another place she calls it his vineyard, and in this place she calls it my vineyard, because it's really his, but it's hers, it's been given to her. You know, this is, this is well, my church, but really my church is his church. Uh, my vineyard, which is mine, is before me, old thou Solomon, must have a thousand. I'm going to pay, I pay a thousand too. Now, you know, I'm in a special position with him, but I give mine out of love. I don't, not out of love, but out of love. I pay my dues to him out of love. I mean, I'm in a special position, but I still am in debt to him. And those that keep the fruit there are 200. In other words, there are those under me who watch over the fruit, those in lesser positions, and I pay them each 200, for the worthy, workman is worthy of his labor. Thou that dwellest in the gardens, the companions hearken to thy voice. Cause me to hear it. There are those that are dwelling in the garden of God. A couple, uh, a couple, a few chapters back, you see the many different fruits and things in his garden. Make haste, my beloved, and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountain of spices. Make haste and come to me and catch me away. Hurry, I can't wait for you any longer. And she closes with a cry to be raptured out to him. And all this comes at the time of the mandrakes and the fruit harvest, the Feast of Tabernacles. God bless you. Uh, oh, before you leave, I must make a short announcement. Uh